Okay, it's your boy Nathan, and uh, we're in volume one of Good Morning Friends, and chapter 40. 40. Wait patiently for him. January the 4th, 1955. Good morning, friends. Recently, when I was in the home of two friends for their golden wedding anniversary, they named Psalm 37 as their favourite scripture passage. This is a discerning preference and one born of Christian experience. Let's listen to David's psalm and understand why. Fret not thyself because of evil doers; neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy right. <clears throat> wow, another exceedingly powerful psalm, eh? And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. <clears throat> because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent their bow, to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be for ever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs They shall consume Into smoke shall they consume away The wicked borroweth and payeth not again But the righteous showeth mercy and giveth For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell for evermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved for ever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell therein for ever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps... <laughs> None of his steps shall slide. 
the wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and be wholly upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be cut off. <laughs> Oops. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord, he is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. Psalm 37, 1-40 What David here deals with and answers for all of us is that vein of perversity in life which plagues us all. We see evildoers flourishing and the righteous struggling to hold their own, and we've got... <laughs> and we become fretful with God and impatient of him. We notice, as David did, the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree, while we find ourselves hindered and frustrated in things small and near to us. In the face of all these things we wonder, where is God and what is he doing? All our rebelliousness is basically a rebellion against God. This does not mean that we must be silent and unresisting in the presence of evil and unjust conditions. We have a moral obligation to work for righteousness and justice under God, but we are called upon to cease from anger and forsake wrath, and to do what we do in perfect faith in God's providence, to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The heart of assurance is this. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and she... <laughs> and he shall bring it to pass. Verses 3-5 Notice what these verses say. There is no promise of escape from the problems that confront us, no promise that this world will become an easy street for us. Rather, they assure us that we can, if we trust and wait in him, know a peace and fullness greater than the world can give. More than that, the desires of our heart shall come to pass as a result of two things, the very things that cause us to suffer, plus waiting patiently on the Lord. Indeed, God makes all things work together for good to them that love him, who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 Then the psalm promises something further. Its chorus might be called the promise that the meek shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5.5 5. Who are these blessed meek? Or whom our Lord also spoke in his... of whom... <laughs> Of whom our Lord also, of whom our Lord, okay, back it up, back it up, back it up. Who are these blessed meek, of whom our Lord also spoke in his Beatitudes? The biblical word meek means tamed. We are the blessed meek when we are tamed by God and our rebellious nature rests in the Lord and waits patiently for him. The blessed meek inherit the world in this life and in the world to come. Their life alone has the flavour and quality of true life here and now. Other people try to live and find life and only find it escaping them. The blessed meek live. Then, for the meek, time only draws them closer to eternity 
and the sufferings of this present life are not to be compared with the joys of eternity. To the meek, the tamed of God, belongs the kingdom. This psalm thus requires four duties of us. 1. Fret not. Do not trouble yourself regarding the mysteries of God's providence. 2. Trust. Rest in the Lord. He permits these things for his purpose and our final good in him. 3. Wait patiently. 4. Do good. In so doing, we become tamed of God. Our Lord's promise to us is this. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5.5 5. Okay, that was pretty good. Praise God for that. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Let's uh, curl this in like a curl machine, like a curly towel. Okay. So let's bump up the gain. Alrighty. All right, that was 40, and see you in 41. Hello, this is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks. Hey, folks, we're in uh, volume one of Good Morning Friends. Chapter 41 41. The Habits of Self-Justification January the 11th, 1955 Good morning, friends. One of the bad habits that all of us share in some degree is the habit of self-justification. This is a weakness we condemn in others and reprimand in our children and yet are ourselves too frequently guilty of. Moreover, self-justification is more than a weakness. It is a sin. First of all, what do we mean when we speak of self-justification? Very simply stated, it means excusing ourselves, but it involves much more than an excuse. It involves also the basic belief on our parts that what we do is excusable because we are basically justified in our way of life and our course of action. We may agree that the particular action under question is questionable and even wrong, but when any particular sin is weighed against us, we feel that the balance are... are <sighs> but when any particular sin is weighed against us, we feel that the balances are overwhelmingly on the side of justice because our own justifiable life outweighs any particular sin. In other words, self-justification means that we insist on excusing ourselves for our sins because we refuse to believe that they tell the whole truth about us. The truth, we insist, is something much better and far finer and must be considered as the determining factor. Because we are good people, we feel that our incidental sins can be and should be overlooked. But what the Bible says about us is very different. It declares that all of us, without exception, can be described only as sinners. Our human nature is characterized by rebellion against God and the desire to be as God. The essence of our speech is not truthfulness, but hypocrisy and the desire to be thought of as better than we actually are. This is the old Adam in us, and the old Adam is a pretender and a masquerader. His life consists of pretenses and masks. He is constantly hiding behind a lie which he insists is the truth, 
and running away from the truth which he calls a lie? Self-justification, therefore, involves the denial of God's truth concerning human nature and his bill of indictment against man. In the face of all this, the Christian should have a different answer. We do not need to justify ourselves because we have been justified by God. To be justified by God means that we accept his charges against us. We recognize that we are sinners in rebellion against God. We place our trust not in any fancied self-righteousness, but in the righteousness of God. This means we live without illusions concerning ourselves, but with faith concerning God. It means distrusting ourselves and trusting God. We see no need for making excuses. We admit the fact of our sinfulness and point to our freedom and justification in Jesus Christ. The sinner is haunted by the continual need for self-justification. His whole life becomes involved in a hypocrisy of pretense and evasion. In an attempt to convince himself and the world that he is... In an attempt to convince himself and the world that he is basically a good man and excusable on those grounds... The Christian has a better excuse, a better justification. Jesus Christ, who assumes the sin and guilt in our stead and cancels it by his cross, and who makes us members of him so that we have by his sanctifying presence our indwelling justification. When we as Christians make excuses and try to justify ourselves, we are living not in Christ but in ourselves, in the old Adam. Our foolish self-justification is nothing compared to the continuing and abiding grace of God. In Our foolish self-justification is nothing compared to the continuing and abiding grace of God in Christ. As the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 11, 5 declares, God doth continue to forgive us. Je la tête ailleurs. Je la tête ailleurs. God doth continue to forgive the sins of those that are justified. The Westminster Larger Catechism summarizes the matter in these words. Answer 70. Justification is an act of God's free grace unto sinners, in which he pardoneth all their sins, accepteth and accounteth their persons righteous in his sight, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but only for the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ by God imputed to them and received by faith alone. Wow, that was great. That was good. It was both great and good. The great and the good. Okay, let's just check. Check a root. The guinea you. Okay, look. Master mix in. Okay, guys. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six. Awesome. Um, so this is going to be the last one in this batch, and then I'm going to have second breakfast. Uh, I mean, the next one's going to be the last one. See you in chapter 42. Okay, peeps, where are we? We're in Good Morning, Friends, Volume 1. Capitolo 42. 42. Who is infallible? January the 18th, 1955 Good morning, friends. Recently I spent a few disturbing minutes with a state official whose attitude I found very distressing. The man was an official of character and integrity, an honest man and deservedly respected for his work. And yet I feel, and so still feel, that there is something dangerous about this man and all such men because he believed that the law does not make a mistake. 
Such an attitude, of course, is not new. The Bible speaks of the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not, Daniel 6, 8, and which, quote, May no man reverse, Esther 8, 8. It was an infallible law as against, against which, It was an infallible law against which shall uh, patta okay uh, try to do two things at the one time okay where are we it was an infallible law against which there was no appeal and no recourse this attitude is not limited to antiquity. Nations constantly tend to divinize their law and to regard themselves as the infallible interpreters of the divine will. Marxist communism makes the dictatorship of the proletariat the expression of the divine working of history, while in our America many people blasphemously assert that the will of the people is the will of God and the voice of the people the voice of God. Nor is this assertion of infallibility limited to governments only. Churches also make this claim. They assert that God speaks through the leader of their church, or that the voice of the presbytery is the voice of the Holy Spirit, and make many like assertions which directly or indirectly lay claim to infallibility. All such attitudes, whether in church or state, are dangerous to the extreme because man is a sinner, and the most obvious fact about him is his... I was going to say infallibility, which would have been wrong. Because man is a sinner, and the most obvious fact about him is his fallibility, his likelihood to sin, to err, to feel, to wander, and to lie... For man to assert his infallibility in any of his actions or institutions is a preposterous claim and a monstrous sin, because man is a creature. Uh, because man is a creature who sins and dies, and God alone is infallible. One common trait is to be found in all persons who lay claim to infallibility either for themselves or for their institutions. All of them, without exception, either underrate, bypass or deny outright God's own infallible word, the Bible. They will defend the authority of men while they deny the authority of God's word. They will assert the supremacy of their institutions and bypass the sole supremacy of God's word. They will fight zealously in defence of their of their infa. They will fight zealously in defence of their infallibility and lie to defend it, while they sneer and deride God's infallible word. Against all this, we must assert that man, in all his doings and all his institutions, is a creature and a sinner born to die, and that God alone is infallible and his Bible is our authority. To accept anything less as our final authority is to destroy all standards other than our own will. Man needs a final authority. Without it, he has no standard, and man cannot make his emotions the final authority because they are given to foolishness and error. Neither can man make his reason or will the arbiter of final authority, because man's reason and will are tainted and corrupted by sin. They have as their orbits the narrow confines of man's limited world, which he can see only through the eyes of sin. Man can never produce authority. All his attempts to do so only destroy authority and supplant it with self-will. Thus, we must assert with the Westminster Divines in the Confession of Faith, chapter 33.3, 3. Yeah, chapter 
All synods or councils since the apostles' times, whether general or particular, may err, and many have erred. Therefore, they are not to be made the rule of faith or practice, but to be used as a help in both. As the larger catechism teaches, answer 3 and answer 4, the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God, the only rule of faith and obedience. The Scriptures manifest themselves to be the Word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consent of all the parts and the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God by their light and power to convince and convert sinners, to comfort and build up believers unto salvation, but the Spirit of God bearing witness by and with the Scriptures in the heart of man is alone able to fully persuade, fully to persuade. <laughs> scriptures in the heart of man, it able fully to persuade it that they are the very Word of God. All right, well, I'm looking forward to a little break. Some more uh, minced beef, ground beef, if you're an American. Okay, well, you know, this is not necessarily the best voiceover work in the world, but I'm enjoying it, thank God for it, and I'm trying to do the absolute best for you. So I hope to see you in the remaining chapters. And in the meantime, I'm going to render these, uh, was there five? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Praise God for that. See you in the next one. Okay, we're in uh, Good Morning Friends, Volume 1, and in Chapter 43. The Lord Directeth. 43. The Lord Directeth. April the 5th. Let's call it between 15th and 5th for a second there. All right. April the 5th, 1955. Good morning, friends. Now and then, when we pause briefly to look back on our lives, we realize that our lives have been so very different from what we once expected. Perhaps in sorting through some old papers, we run across a long-forgotten picture of ourselves, and it brings back a sudden rush of memories. We realise how young we were then, and how little we knew, and yet how high our hopes and pride were as... And yet, how high our hopes and pride were as we looked to the future. Perhaps we wonder, will the future be as unexpected as the past has been? More than that, will it be as definitely beyond our shaping and control? Years ago, we had a hopeful picture of what our future would be. The present hour finds us very different from that picture. Will tomorrow be... I'm just having a difficulty coordinating things here a little bit. Okay. Will tomorrow be as impossible for us to design as today has been? Yet, in a very real sense, we are today what all our yesterdays have made us. We are responsible and cannot evade the responsibility for our present situation and our present state. And yet, when we press our accountability to the limit, something still escapes us. We are not omnipotent, we are not all-powerful, and all our attempting to shape our lives leaves something lacking. A long time ago, a man faced this same mystery concerning his own life. He had begun with such rich promise, only to fall into abject foolishness and emerge at the end with a sad and humble wisdom. Looking back, Solomon wrote marked. Looking back, Solomon remarked, as Proverbs 16.9 gives it, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Moffat translates it thus, A man thinks out his plans, 
but the Eternal controls his course. Let's examine the meaning of that verse. A man thinks out his plans, but with what results? The most careful planner finds his life a frustrating thing to deal with. So much of it escapes his planning. And even when the little he can plan has so many loose ends, that planning is a sure guide to frustration if a man tries to be comprehensive about it. James, the brother of our Lord, had this day had this to say. Had this to say about our planning, as Moffat translated it. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to such and such a city, we shall spend a year there trading and making money. You who know nothing about tomorrow, for what is your life? You are but a mist which appears for a little and then vanishes. You ought rather to say, if the Lord's will, if the Lord will. If the Lord will, we shall live, we shall live to do this. Hang on. Sorry. If the Lord will, we shall live to do this or that. But here you are, boasting in your proud pretensions. All such boasting is wicked. James 4, 13-16 Yes, a man thinks out his plan, but because man is not omnipotent, nor can man control or shape all the factors in his life, he cannot control his course. Now this would leave man in a fearful predicament if there were no control whatsoever to rule and overrule in his life. But, as Solomon pointed out, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. A man thinks out his plans, but the Eternal controls his course. Because our lives have failed to develop as we planned that they should, does not mean that they are without direction or purpose. As long as we walk in faith as members of Jesus Christ, we are part of a total plan which makes all things work together for good. And if the Lord has brought defeat to your plans and mine, it is only because he has a better one which must and shall prevail. The Lord directs, and his leadings are sure and infallible. In the words of Samuel Rodegast's soul hymn, Whate'er my God ordains is right, holy his will abideth. I will be still whate'er he doth, and follow where he guideth. He is my God, though dark my road, he holds me that I shall not fall, wherefore to him I leave it all. Whate'er my God ordains is right, he never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path, I know he will not leave me. I take content what he hath sent, his hands can turn my griefs away, and patiently I wait his day. Whate'er my God ordains is right, though now this cup in drinking may bitter seem to my faint heart, I take it all unshrinking. Tears pass away with dawn of day, sweet comfort yet shall fill my heart, and pain and sorrow shall depart. Whate'er my God ordains is right, here shall my stand be taken. Though sorrow, need, or death be mine, yet I am not forsaken. My Father's care is round me there, he holds me that I shall not fail. Fall. My Father's care is round me there, he holds me that I shall not fall, and so to him I leave it all. Samuel Rodegast, Whate'er My God Ordains Is Right, 1675 A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Proverbs 6 Still have some difficulty getting into this. Proverbs 16, 9. All right, folks. 
let's add that to the render queue. Okay, and hope to see you in chapter 44. Here we are. Chapter 44 in Good Morning Friends, Volume 1. Forty-four, sifted in a sieve, March the eighth, nineteen fifty-five. Good morning, friends. One of the things which we must constantly bear in mind when we read scripture is that we must take God at His word. Hang on a second. There's some banging going on. One of the things which we must constantly bear in mind when we read scripture is that we must take God at his word. If we believe only as far as it pleases us, then all we accept is our own word because we establish as true only that which is acceptable to us. With this in mind, let's look at a verse which says something we especially need to hear. Amos 9.9 for behold, lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn or grain is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. This verse, of course, deals specifically with God's dealing with Israel, but it declares a principle of God's procedure, which is equally true of his dealing with us. This is a process of sifting. Obviously, Israel was in for a rough time. To be sifted in a sieve means to be broken until the chaff is removed from the grain and completely separated. Hebrews speaks of this same divine process, declaring that God's purpose is the removing of those things which are... Uh, shall I bet, ta? the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Hebrews 12, 27. The apostles in Acts 14, 22 make it clear that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Most Christians prefer to think of life in Christ as all sweetness and light. Some actually try to believe that the Christian's privilege is to be freed from tribulation. But God's very specific purpose with us who are But God's very specific purpose with us who are his good seed or grain as it were is to sift us that the chaff may be separated from us. And it would take a bold and foolish person to claim that he has no chaff in his life and therefore needs no sifting. The storms and troubles of this world, and your personal problems and mine, are God's sifting of us and must be accepted as such in faith, patience and humility. History is God's mighty sieve separating the chaff from the wheat. But there is more to this verse than the promise of sifting. With this promise of tribulation comes the strange and yet reassuring declaration, Yet shall not the least grain fall upon... Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. The Lord's sifting... The Lord's sifting promise is a guarantee that we shall be shaken and broken, but with it comes the great promise. There shall be no loss in this process, only gain. Now, both these facts seem incredible to us and perhaps hard to believe, but we are asked to believe them. First, that God will sift us and we cannot evade the sifting and shaking which will separate the chaff from the wheat. And second, that God will not allow the least of us to fall or to suffer permanently as a result of this process. Its outcome will be only gain. In view of this, we can indeed give assent to the words of an old 17th century hymn. Give to the winds thy fears, hope and be undismayed. 
God hears thy sighs and counts thy tears. God shall lift up thy head. Through waves and clouds and storms he gently clears thy way. Wait thou his time, so shall this night soon end in joyous day. Leave to his sovereign sway to choose and to command, so shalt thou wandering own his way. How wise, how strong his hand! Far, far above thy thought his counsel shall appear, when fully he the work hath wrought that causes thy needless fear. Paul Gerhardt, give to the winds thy tears, thy fears. Wow. Give to the winds thy fears, 1656, translated John Wesley in collections, 1737. Okay, all right. Give to the winds thy, thy fears, wonderful. Yep, you guessed it. Now let's render that bad boy. Okay, that was chapter 44. Let's see you in chapter 55. Well done for listening right to the end. If you would like to know more about this important Christian audiobook project, please go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks.